So welcome everyone to our Division 10 webinar on writing and publishing. I'm Paul Silvey, I'm kind of the host, moderator, and, and MC. Uh, so first to kick things off, and then I'll, I'll talk about what we're doing. First to kick things off, we have Jen Katz, born in Contro, current chair or current president of Division 10, who wants to say a little bit about the division and welcome everybody. Hi everyone, thanks for joining. Um, and thanks for that panelist, Talia Goldstein and, and Mike Mumford and, and Paul Sylvia for putting this together. I really appreciate their very precious time. We know that time is a, uh, an important commodity right now. And so this is really exciting for the division to be able to extend um, its outreach a little bit more. What I wanted to do is just spend a couple minutes telling you a little bit about the division and then I'm going to hand it over to Paul. I won't spend too much time, but I did want to make you aware of Division 10 membership benefits. If you are not already a member, we'd love you to consider it. We have um, our website down here. Of course, you can find out information there, but just a real quick overview. Our annual fee has stayed the same for many, many, many years and it's kept at a low rate, just so we can encourage people to join. So you do not have to be a member of APA to join. You can just actually join the division itself if you would like, and it comes with a number of benefits. So this year we started a mentorship program to pair um, scholars with, it's, it's either junior scholars or students with more senior scholars in the field to help with your research agenda and building out different studies and different career trajectories that you might be thinking of. We also have a microgrant program that we started to seed new research in the areas of aesthetics, creativity, and the art, and a webinar program. So this is one of the webinars we're hosting and we had a creativity salon and have partnered with a number of different universities like SUNY Buffalo and Florida State very soon to hold other creativity salons because the field of creativity research and empirical aesthetics is just booming. We have a number of different division um, awards that are eligible for, um, uh, excuse me, um, with which division um, members can be eligible to apply for each year. And then we recognize those awardees at the annual APA conference, convention, excuse me. We're also developing a new opportunity, which is to hold our own division 10 independent conference um, and then just in general, we have a really nice, robust sort of international network that is really great. So if you're interested in extending your collaborations or if you're going up for tenure and promotion and you need to have an international impact <laughs> as universities like to see, and you want to be able to confer with like-minded people about research in this area, the division is really great because we have a pretty active listserv and different groups of researchers who do research in different areas. The journal actually, which will be featured with our um, editor, Dr. Goldstein today, um, it comes free with your membership. So PACA, as we call it, Psychology of Aesthetics, Creativity and the Arts. And then if you do apply to present at the annual APA convention in August, we do a number of things to keep people together. So we have an executive committee and a business committee meeting, but the fun part is the social and the student social. So um, we invite you to consider joining um, if you're not already a member. Thanks so much for your time. Excellent, great. So, uh, so again, I'm sort of moderating. Really, this is kind of an informal Q&A, a chance to ask questions. We thought this would be a great time for a webinar and writing and publishing because it's for a lot of us, it's summertime in the university system, and summer means the start of epic eyebrow singeing binge writing, where people write up all the stuff they had meant to write up but didn't quite get around to it. So the timing's good here. So we have uh, two editors. We have Talia Goldstein, co-editor of Psychology of Sex, Creative Arts, and Michael Mumford, editor of Creativity Research Journal. So I'll ask them to just say a little bit about the journal and maybe one big piece of advice for people who are thinking of submitting there. And then we'll just open it up as a q and I have, um, it's probably easiest. So we have it set up in the chat. It's just if you have any questions anytime, just pop them into the chat and I'll kind of distill and synthesize and kind of pull out the, the questions that, um, that seem sort of most common and I'll sort of pitch those to it. So I'll kind of 
moderate the questions just because we have a lot of people on it'll make it easier. So first to hand it over, Talia, why don't you take it away? Say a little bit about Paca and sure. uh, some tips. Thanks so much. So yeah, so I'm uh, Talia Goldstein. I'm at George Mason University. Um, and I've been co-editor of PACA for the last three years with Ocean Vartanian, and my term goes for another three years. So I'm going to be hanging out with the journal for a while. And before that, I was associate editor and editorial board for since the inception, actually, in, in 2006 of this new iteration of the journal. Um, so PACA publishes a huge variety of articles, theoretical, empirical, experimental, across sort of every topic in creativity and aesthetic reasoning, aesthetic judgment, aesthetic response, and engagement with the arts across literature and creative writing, visual arts, music, drama, theater. We publish therapeutic intervention uh, studies and analyses. We publish uh, meta-analyses and conceptual reviews of papers. So PACA is really a broad topical journal. Um, and I would say my, my key piece of advice is what's wonderful about PACA is Unlike in other more mainstream journals, for example, I'm a developmental psychologist. If I wanted to publish in the journal Developmental Psychology, I'd have to spend a lot of time talking about why studying the arts and development is an important thing to study. For PACA, you don't have to justify your existence in aesthetics or in creativity or in the arts sort of as a baseline because we already think those topics are worthwhile for empirical, experimental, psychological study. That being said, you do need to make sure your work is well grounded in the existing literature. We will get often papers that um, cite back to Guilford's 1950s definition of creativity and then skip ahead to 2021 um, saying sort of, and now we're going to make some progress. There's a rich, uh, large history in the study of creativity across multiple disciplines, across multiple sub-disciplines within psychology. There's lots and lots of empirical research out there on the arts and what they do for kids and adults. There's lots and lots of research on aesthetics across different art forms and aesthetic reasoning uh, from neuroscience to naturalistic observation studies. So my number one piece of advice is make sure that your work is well grounded in the existing literature to the work and done. We can't really claim we're a brand new field anymore. We can't really claim that nothing's ever been done in these topics before. So make sure you're sort of integrated into where your work and where your study or your theory breaks new ground amongst all the stuff that's already been done. Paul, I think you're muted. I had nothing insightful to say anyways. Mike, take it away. Uh, Mike Mumford, University of Oklahoma. Um, I took over CRJ about a year and a half ago from Mark Runko when he started to hit health problems. Uh, to Talia's point, um, the journal really had to be reconfigured um, substantially. Mark had done most of the work running that journal over the years, pretty much on his own. Um, the field has become though highly active. So we're running 250 to 300 manuscript submissions per year. Um, of those, we're probably gonna publish 35 to 40. Uh, We've gone to an associate editor system. The associate editors are Roger Beatty, uh, Adam Green, Indra Vikostas, Aaron Coslett, Kay Kim, Sam Hunter, and Logan Watts, which is a rather large group of associate editors. On the other hand, the range of material that comes in is huge and we want specialized editors addressing each topic. Um, we are different than PACA. We, we don't do aesthetics. That's not really anything we would publish. Uh, we do publish a little bit on the arts, but usually art performance. Um, our major focus is clearly creative thinking, creative performance, um, looking at it 
from everything from education to uh, industrial and organizational psychology to neuroscience. If it is relevant to creativity, we will publish it. We have no methodological preferences. Um, we will publish survey research. We will publish qualitative research. We will publish experimental research. Uh, we will publish historiometric research. It is all fine with us with the provision that the research be reasonably well done. And note the word reasonably, okay? Um, our process, when a submission comes in, I review the initial submission within a week. Uh, typically, there'll be a desk reject decision at that point or the manuscript will go out to one of the associate editors. The associate editor picked for the manuscript is always appropriate for the content of the manuscript. So you're not getting random editorial decisions, I hope. Um, we're down to about, ooh, um, probably average time to, from sending it out to an associate editor to getting an initial decision letter back is at this point about three and a half months, which is reasonably quick. It's hard to do it much faster than that. Um, it's a good journal. Um, it's been fundamental to creativity for many years. Um, where I see problems our peop is not so much the type of method used, but not executing the method appropriately. Um, example would be, we'll get a qualitative study in, but the author won't provide an interview protocol. The author won't provide integrator agreement coefficients. These are ba very basic things for qualitative articles. Similarly with survey studies, we'll get a survey study in but there won't be any control measures for source method bias. Th these are kind of automatic desk reject decisions. Um, I th we are more, I believe, a little more heavily focused on empirical research than theoretical work at this point. We will occasionally publish theoretical articles, but they have to say something fundamentally new. And to Thalia's point, have to be well grounded in the literature. Great. So I'll open this up for questions. So again, if you have a question, we've got some that have already popped in the chat. Some of you might know that the chat set up, the, the messages go only to the host just to avoid kind of everyone getting bombarded with anything. So if you have any questions, just type them in. You don't need to wait for any particularly good time. So I'll just kind of pull them out and pitch them. And so one that I'll, that I'll sort of pull here is a classic question. So what, um, what would the journals like to see more of? Like, what is it that you're not getting that you think would be nice to get more of? And what is it, if anything, maybe, maybe you're seeing a little too much of? I'll just give it over to Talia first, I guess. Um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a great question. Uh, so I will say that our breakdown, um, both in our submission rates and in our acceptance and publication rates, we're about 50% creativity, 25% and 25% the arts. Um, and that I think is reflective probably of the number of research labs that are doing work in each of these areas. Uh, and then within creativity, I would say that somewhere between 15 and 25% of the of those articles are measurement and, and types of measurement and studies of measurement and different kinds of analyses of different kinds of measurement under different contexts. And it's a really sort of, um, we've had some special issues on measurement. You know, it's a critically important piece of the puzzle. And so uh, it's not surprising to me that that's a lot of what we see. 
we don't get a lot of articles on music. And I think the reason either music processing and aesthetic response to music or um, music creation, either sort of studies of improvisation in music or studies of musicians, um, we don't get a lot of articles there. And I think the reason we don't is because they actually are separate journals that are that handle music psychology or separate journals that um, look at music neuroscience or music performance, music cognition music education. Um, but I would love for PACA to have some more of those types of articles as well, particularly articles that look at, at aesthetic reasoning and around music or um, music as sort of a an avenue to creativity or how you are creative within music, something like that. So that's that's an area that's really mainstream in the arts and psychology that we just don't get a lot of. Um, I actually wouldn't say we get too much of anything. Um, I don't feel like we're sort of overly, overly hit with any particular topic. There are certainly topics that come and go in popularity, um, but, but I wouldn't say there's anything that I'm sort of like, eh, we don't need any more studies on that. And, and that's because even though, as I said a few minutes ago, full research in this area and and as Jen mentioned as well we're really a, a, an active and Mike mentioned an active and growing area um, compared to something like basic studies in perception or uh, the development of social skills or something like that I mean we're sort of there's so much still to be discovered there's so many open questions so yeah any any and all topics welcome excellent all right where are you at CRJ Mike um what I would like to see more of is I would like to see more well done historiometric studies. Um, I would. It, um, that's fallen off the charts. And those studies have always been very important to the field. Um, Aaron Cosplit's work on analyzing Beethoven, it, it, beautiful piece, very fundamental. Um, I, we're probably not seeing as much as we used to see, and I would like to see more on creative thinking skills, particularly creative thinking processes in greater depth. Um, an example would be we need more studies of elaborative processes and conceptual combination. Um, I'd like to see more well done field studies, um, more well done qualitative studies. We get them in, unfortunately, they're just not following division five standards. Um, um, what I think we're seeing too much of, um, probably too many poorly done survey studies uh, would be my take. Uh, the particular focus, and I hate to say this because of the other part of my career, but they're often leadership studies with mediator number 122 producing absolutely no additional knowledge. Um, I probably generally speaking would like to see the range increase somewhat, but we weight pretty heavily doing something new and doing something new in a new population. Um, so example, we have um, one out that, that I'm 99% sure will get accepted on political cartoons and creativity of political cartoon writers. Nice study, actually interesting, reasonably important. Um, where we're not seeing, the other two places we're not seeing stuff is we're not seeing what I would call macro environmental influences on real world creativity. So I'm not getting many studies in comparing um, nanotech organizations and the structure of nanotech organizations as it contributes to creativity. Mm -hmm. Um, finally, we're not seeing many multi-level studies and given the nature of creativity, which is a voluntary activity, those multi-level studies may be very important. Uh, we tend to focus on individuals and kind of forget 
that individual is responding to a team, that individual is responding to a profession, that individual is responding to a professional context. That leads to my last comment. Um, I would dearly like to see studies of how professions shape and influence creativity, but they occur so seldom. I don't think I've seen one come across my desk in two years. Interesting. So we have, a, we have an interesting question here from, from Brandon, which to kind of distill and summarize here. So it's a good question because both of these journals attract kind of interdisciplinary audiences, including outside the social sciences. And so we asked, is, is there anything you could discuss regarding tone or style? So I generally practice in the humanities and obviously humanists and psychologists structure and write articles in significantly different ways. So for example, we have people in communication studies, people in philosophy, people in art history, or perhaps even people in, um, in business diffusion of, of such. Is there any advice you can offer for people writing sort of outside of psychology um, who want to submit work to these journals? Oh yeah, you want to go first? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so so it's a really um, it's an important question because of the interdisciplinary nature of of PACA. Um, it's sort of written written in the very title of the journal. Uh, the thing that I always try to keep in mind is that we are a journal that is part of the American Psychological Association public. Um, we're a nonprofit journal in that way, and we are sort of. Uh, bound and guided by the, the formatting and the rules of the APA. Um, so my piece of advice to people who are trying to write from a humanities perspective or from a philosophy perspective for psychology journals, for psychology of aesthetics, creativity, and the arts is um, to read a bunch of articles that were published in PACA um, and to make sure, this comes back to grounding in the literature, to make sure that the work that you're citing and the, and the work that you're coming from, um, you have a sense for how, how those articles are written for the fact that, uh, you know, the way that I describe it to students and, and collaborators is that you're working in this sort of hourglass shape where you're starting with theoretical perspectives and then distilling down um, into why you chose your particular methods, why you chose your particular participants, uh, why you chose your particular analytical strategy, and then from those results sort of building back out again into how that further informs theory, implications, um, um, you know, real world outcomes, that sort of thing. So I think, um, you know, one of the big differences for me between um, something that is written for a humanities audience and something that is written for a psychology art audience is level of specificity um, and how much in depth uh, versus how reductionistic you need to be about the citations that you're pointing to and the literature that you're pulling from. Um, PACA has a outward bound um, limit of 40 pages, including references. Uh, if you want to go beyond that, you can always email us as the editors and give us an abstract and, and tell us why you might need more than that. But for the most part, we want you to keep it below that and, and even significantly below that, closer to 30 pages if possible. So keeping that in mind, keeping the sort of ne necessary reductionist reductionistic sort of way that the social sciences approach humanities topics in mind and, and reading articles from the journal that you're trying to publish in to see where that style comes from and um, the elements that make sense to you. Um, that would be, that would be my, my sort of keynote. And then also you should always have, if this is really outside your, your typical writing style or really outside your field, um, you should get into some sort of like manuscript reading exchange with a colleague at your institution or with you know somebody you know who's gone who's sort of on the other side of the interdisciplinary um, or of the disciplinary boundary from yourself and make sure that they're reading it and it makes sense to them and that the you know the words that sort of are inherent and obvious to you in your field may not be inherent and obvious to psychologists and so making sure that you're defining the appropriate terms and not going into too much detail and things that sort of everybody 
everybody knows. So I have colleagues in theater uh, when I publish in theater journals and they read my stuff and I read their stuff. And that's how we make sure that we're speaking each other's language, which is like, you know, key to interdisciplinary work. Great, Mike. Um, I, I'm gonna echo some of Thalia, but be more rigid. Um, I, I see no reason at all why anyone working in the humanities, why anyone working um, in history cannot present their material within APA format, meaning there should be an introduction, there should be a method, there should be results, there should be a discussion interpretation. That I think must be there. Um, an example being, look, if you're doing a historic study, I wanna know why you selected these people to study. I wanna know where your source material was from. I wanna know how you analyze that source material. Um, so in a, as a general sense, I'm pretty intolerant, frankly. If it doesn't follow that format, I'm going to say, ooh. Um, we do not like opinion pieces at CRJ. And I'm afraid much of the humanities work that comes in is often opinions about creativity. And if there's anything we have learned over the years is people stereotypes of creativity, including scholars stereotypes of creativity are often rather inaccurate. Um, opinion pieces, we really do not want to see. Um, that is not to say I don't want to see a good, well, well done qualitative study comparing six or seven artists with regard to how they developed various artistic techniques or mutual influence of them on each other, etc. Rather, it's got to be factual. And it really has to be an APA format. I, I just can't see a reason for not following it. Here's a, I will say the, the oh. type of, oh, I just wanted to add one quick thing, which was to, to, to add to what uh, Mike just said. We often get personal narratives at PACA um, and those, th those just aren't pieces. They're not quite opinion pieces. They're more about the personal artistic practice. Um, and often they're not grounded in psychology. Um, so it's not that sort of personal artistic practice is a, is a hard no, uh, but it would really have to say something new and be super, super well grounded in the psychological literature to get past um, desk, desk editorial decision. So as a, a good follow-up, so a couple of questions that come in to sort of still them together. I think this is a, a big question on a lot of the minds of people here today is sort of do the journals you're at consider work on creative arts therapies, but also sort of specifically like what, what kinds of creative arts therapy work um, sort of are you looking for? What kinds are better suited for other kinds of journals? Like how does this this side of the division kind of intersect with the, with the journals. Yeah, let me, uh, this is one I think thought you can answer in much greater depth than I can. We would consider art therapy pieces as long as there's systematic evaluation data attached to it and it's a well done evaluation study. Um, and the focus is in our case on development of creative potential through the arts. That's probably more the exception. Thalia's journal deals much more with this than we do. So it's your show, Thalia. <laughs> yeah, so I will say that um, Paca has published a good number of very strong articles on various art therapies. Um, visual arts therapy, drama therapy is a, is a big area of research. Uh, but um, we are actually at the point where uh, simple program evaluations that are specific to a particular type of art therapy program or a particular iteration of a program um, or correlational pre-post findings that don't have a control group are unlikely to make it through peer review. They'll often go out to peer review if there's a particular population that hasn't been studied before. Um, for example, uh, we had an article, um, we've, had, we've had articles on survivors of various community traumas such as the Holocaust um, or the genocide in Rwanda where art 
therapy has been um, a modality of therapy with those populations. Um, and those are articles where the, the strength of the population being studied and the reasons why these modalities may be particularly appropriate for these populations um, was really well thought out and really well um explained with a solid grounding in the sort of broader cognitive behavioral therapy literature or the broader sort of therapeutic modality literature. And so um, in those cases, lack of control group or a sort of more simple program evaluation is acceptable. But more generally, again, this is one of these places is where the literature is just flourishing and the number of papers coming out is just flourishing. Um, and so at this point, the standards of evidence uh, are getting higher and higher um, to, to be able to be published in the journal because we're looking for generalizability, right? Are these programs, are these modalities, are these techniques that have implications across therapeutic contexts, across populations? Um, can you talk about outputs for an extended period of time, right? An eight week intervention is wonderful, uh, but what happens six weeks after the intervention and six months after the intervention ends? So the standard of evidence required for publication is just growing and growing as the field becomes broader and has more evidence and weight behind it. So we're very open to, to art therapy uh, of various modalities, but, um, but all of our types of papers, it's getting harder and harder to get into the journal. Our, our, um, our rejection rate goes up every year and we're still below publisher target actually um, by about 10%. So they want us to be rejecting even more than we've been rejecting. And in 2020, we had um, almost 30% more submission over the course of the year of 2020. So it's just, um, we have to reject, unfortunately, many really wonderful studies and many strong papers, unfortunately, are still sort of not making it to publication because there's too much good stuff out there. Great. So here's, um, here's one that uh, actually, as someone who used to work at a German university, I'm kind of curious about. So, uh, so much of the work being done, of course, is by people writing in English that in English is, is not their first language or their second language or their third language or their fourth language. And of course, these are both English language journals. What advice can you give to people, particularly younger scholars and early career scholars who are, are writing research manuscripts in English, not English not be the first language for your journals? So. Um, yeah, Mike, go ahead. Okay. Um, don't use the word very a lot would be probably my first comment, <laughs> which is a little harsh, but kind of true. Uh, we will not reject an article based on the quality of the English language. What we will do is we will request that you take the manuscript to somebody can rewrite it in English or help you rewrite it in English. Um, and that has worked quite well. Every case we have done that, that has turned out just fine. It does take more time to get the manuscript published, of course, because you have to go talk to that person. But we will not reject it based on poor English writing quality. It, for us, it's poor methodological quality. Um, I will say for us, we get a very wide range. Um, so there are some articles that come in where unfortunately the level of English is such that I can't quite tell what was done. Um, I can't quite tell sort of what the method actually was, what the protocol actually was, what data are actually being analyzed. Um, and unfortunately, in that case, it's often hard to tell whether that's a language barrier or whether that's a quality of the research barrier. Um, so that's the sort of low end of the range. Um, I will say, though, uh, just like with CRJ, we're not going to reject an article on on the quality of the English. And I'm a fluent Spanish speaker and I could not possibly write an academic article in Spanish. I, I'm, I mean, it's just amazing um, that our international scholars sort of write in multiple languages. And, and we're very aware that um, 
that you're writing in a, in a second language or a third language. So uh, one thing that APA does have is uh, they have uh, an English editorial service that we can point you towards. Um, that would be maybe at the revision stage or at the accept with minor revisions stage. Um, we can point you towards APA editorial help uh, and, and sort of have the language cleaned up a little bit in that way. Um, often reviewers will point to specific uh, specific sentences, paragraphs, tense errors that need to be fixed. Um, but yeah, again, we're, we're never going to reject a manuscript. If the manuscript makes sense methodologically and the results make sense as coming from the study that was done, um, but the introduction needs some English language help, that's, ne that's never going to be a, a, a basis for rejection. Precise point, a reiteration. If we can't read the method and understand what you basically did, that's going to be a problem right there. Um, yeah, the other parts of the manuscript we're, we're more forgiving on, but the reviewers have to be able to see what you did and how you did it. And if that's fuzzy, even if it's language, it's going to be a problem. So I got, I got to combine a couple of methodological questions into one here to make it compact. So uh, uh, collectively, so one is, what is your opinions on mediational studies with cross-sectional designs? Like just touching that third rail right there. And no, it's not a third rail. It's, it's a, it is a very bad idea. Um, I will explain why. <laughs> One. I'm, glad, I'm glad we got our answer here, actually. Uh, oh, remember my other life is editing leadership quarterly. So I'm quite good at this. Um, first, typically those studies are all surveys in the predictor, all surveys in the criteria. So there's a source method bias problem. Factor analysis does not address the source method problem. All the source method variance has to be taken out before you analyze your data. What that means is you need a control variable. And preferably, by the way, analyzing the residual database after you've taken out all the control variance. Having said that, most mediational studies are path model studies. Problem is that model is inherently indeterminate. Um, meaning I can flip the path coefficients in the other direction and you'll get the same finding. So the only way we would really consider that type of study, and in this case, it would be me as editor because you're now in the desk reject zone. Um, it would really require um, additional types of data, e.g. interview data, e.g. historic data, e.g. experimental data, showing the mediator operates in the same way where clear conclusions can be drawn. Um, and if that's not done, it, it's just, it's really not gonna survive. I, I can't state this otherwise. And I don't think there's gonna be any variation in my land about it, meaning kind of creativity, IO psychology land. I was on a tirade there. Yeah, I think, I think <laughs> I, there's nothing I appreciate more I, than a good tirade. What about you, Talia? Um, I, I don't disagree, but I will, I will soften just a little bit in saying that um, if it is framed as an exploratory analysis, if it is, if it is very clear that these are new constructs being linked to one another, new mediating variables that are not commonly measured in this population, but that's a high bar to clear at this point. Um, actually, the very first question about what what paper are you, what, what type of paper 
not need to see anymore. I don't need to see any more papers that are correlations between self-reported experience in the visual arts and ability to perceive differences between colors, for example, right? So sort of when, when your measurement of artistry is a self-report, yes, no, I'm an artist, visual artist, musician, actor, whatever, and your outcome variable is something that uh, is, again, just sort of a... a a self-report survey measure and not a task, or even if it is a task, but it's a very low level task. Um, those papers, they're, they're pretty well established in the field. There's there's pretty good literature there so showing correlations between different kinds of arts experience and different kinds of outcomes. So if it's new and you are very sure it's new and nobody's ever tested this mediator before and it's exploratory in nature and you're setting it up to be exploratory in nature, that's a, that's a pretty tight road to walk down. That's a pretty complex maze to get through. Um, but I don't wanna give a hard no because every now and then I get a paper that surprises me like risk taking in circus artists post injury with a population from Cirque du Soleil, the best circus company in the world. That was a pretty cool paper. It was all correlational, but nobody's ever published on it before. And so I was I was happy to accept that paper with some work on the English because it was French authors um, and it actually came out this month. So, yeah. Interesting. Now, one, uh, one other thing here, and I think this is part of why you saw such a strong reaction from me. It is very clear, creative people, the greater the creativity, the more critical they are of themselves. That finding has been clear for the last 10 years. And then you're asking people the question, how creative are you? And I sit there when I read these and I go, I'm really not sure these findings are going to be realistic. Well, sort of a, our next question kind of extends on this a little bit. So are there any, thinking of participant populations, so there's some, obviously we talked about kind of weird samples and college student samples. What kinds of participant populations would you particularly like to see more of? Like what are the kinds of groups that are not being studied where it'd be, it would be really neat to get some papers uh, studying yeah, populations? I want to start here, okay? I want to tell a little story. Once I was sitting at our IO conference, a friend of mine was sitting next to me. And he watched my, me grimace and my face kept getting redder and redder. And, and Phil looks at me, goes, Mike, you're getting upset. And I go, I'm going outside and I'll come back for the next paper. And the reason was, and I kid you not, they were studying creativity in telecommunication service workers. Now, if you know anything about telecommunication service work, there is no creativity. It, it's really not possible. You get a script as to how to answer each and every question. And what I would prefer people to do is start looking at the job and the actual job requirements and focusing on those cases where there are complex, novel, ill-defined problems being presented to the people. And unfortunately, we get too many studies in that do not justify the creativity required on the task. And this applies to the arts as well. Not all arts work is creative. I was a symphony musician. Believe me, there, there are pieces where there's no creativity required. Um, and we have to start looking at does the work involved really require creative thinking? Um, yeah, so I think, you know, the, the, the hard work of going outside of Western white majority member populations just hasn't been done in our journal. Um, I, you know, there, there are 
For example, I wanted to look and see what kind of work had been published on cultural appropriation and the psychology of cultural appropriation in various art forms, um, across various art forms. And I found a lot of really amazing cultural studies work. I found a lot of philosophically informed humanities work. I found some really great African-American studies, um, uh, scholars writing on these topics, lots of personal essays, but the psychological components of cultural appropriation, I could not find anything. I couldn't find a single article that had taken the tools and methods of psychology. Sorry, bumping my computer. I'm about to gesture wildly. Um, I couldn't find anything that, that looked at something like social dominance orientation and willingness to engage in cultural appropriation, uh, intergroup contact and delays in cultural appropriation versus cultural appreciation. Uh, there just wasn't anything that looked at it from either the majority perspective or the underrepresented minoritized um, perspective. So we in psychology of the arts, psychology of creativity, psychology of aesthetics, um, a lot of this work has been up to this point, samples of convenience, right? So the artists from the arts organization that you already have the pre-existing contact with, or visitors to the museum where they had to pay $25 to get into the museum in the first place. Um, and so I think that as a field, we have to start doing the hard work of community-based research, participatory research, um, going into to uh, communities and populations and studying from the perspective of aesthetics or the arts, what is important to that, that community, right? Because what we don't want to do is the sort of uh, come in, give a bunch of surveys on the things I think are important and then walk away and form my own conclusions, right? The sort of col colonizer method of doing research. We want to be embedded in the communities that we want to study. So the populations that are absolutely missing from the journal are are populations that are minoritized across psychology and, and their voices um, and research partnerships across, um, across different communities, right? Latin America, Africa, India, uh, right? There are sort of major odds of the world with huge histories of creative arts, psychology happening that are not being published in PACA. Um, so wide open opportunities there, but hard work to be done. Yeah, I, I want to do a quick addendum to my, uh, my earlier comment. Not that I want to change it in any way, shape or form, by the way, but I don't really see enough coming in the door that looks at creativity in jobs that require substantial real creativity. Uh, example, police officer work really requires creativity. It's often social creativity, but I don't see that coming in my door. Um, the State Department requires some creativity. I don't see articles on State Department officers coming in my door. Um, my point here is I think we have bounded the type of creative work we look at a little too tightly to what, what I would call um, naive versions of what creative work actually is. So we kind of- I'd like to see what? it. If any of you guys want to do it, it's great by me. Go ahead, Paul, sorry. All right, sorry. So we've got a, a cluster of questions, which uh, I'll just kind of bring all together. It's a great question. So if they all sort of concern in some ways open science practices, such as pre-registration, uh, posting preprints on SciArchive and the nature of peer review. So I guess in general, how are how do your journals view projects that are or aren't pre-registered or that do or don't put preprints on SciArchive? And what's the nature of the peer review process in terms of blind or double blind or even triple blind, someone asked? Sure. Um, so PACA has actually as far as I know, it's only been one so far, but one is important because now we have a process in place where we accepted a paper, uh, a pre, we accepted a pre-registration uh, 
Uh, and then the and the pre registration and the write up of the pre registration went through peer review. Uh, and then when the paper came in with the results uh, and the findings and the implications, it was already accepted. And so the authors didn't have to go through any more peer review because the pre registration had been um, had gone through review and been accepted. Um, as far as posting preprints go, um, we are bound by the American Psychological Association, our publisher, uh, which I believe does allow for preprints in certain situations. It's on their website, I would read that carefully before putting anything up on Psych Archive. Um, I know once you have been accepted to the journal, you just splash a little like pre-written this paper has this paper may not be the paper of record but has been accepted you know in 2020 to 2021 to PACA and then that can go on your personal website and a few other places um, but as far as preprints go so I as co-editor of PACA love preprints love reading them love looking at them love posting them um, understand that if you post a preprint a reviewer can very easily put the title of the paper into Google and find your preprint. So as long as that's okay with you as the author, then that's okay with me as the editor. Um, APA <laughs> has their own set of rules and regulations around it. And again, please read very carefully those before posting a preprint online. Um, then as far as pre-registration and open science practices go to, please, please, please make sure engaging in open science practices and you write about them in your manuscript that the link is not broken, that the link is anonymized, and that the link actually says what you say that it does. Because often, and this has been found by Center for Open Science and several other places that are doing audits of open science, people are not giving the right link. They are putting some materials but not other materials. And reviewers really dislike that. And often the manuscript will not get through peer review if your open sciences practices are sort of backfiring on you because they're not complete. So do make sure that they're complete if you're going to cite to them, if you're going to link to them, if you're going to engage uh, uh, your reviewers and ask your reviewers to go into those documents. Reviewers are going into the documents. Reviewers are going and looking at your protocols and your materials and your data sets. So again, make sure your data sets are anonymized. Make sure that they're, you know, that they actually say what you say they say, that the, that the variable lists are, are what they need to be because Unfortunately, what we're seeing is um, it counts against you if they're not, and reviewers don't like it if they're not. Um, all of our reviews are uh, double blind, so the um, reviewers don't know who the authors are. The authors don't know who the reviewers are. We do have a few reviewers that like to sign their reviews, um, and I honor the reviewers' choices to do that um, if they want to do that. Uh, if the authors want to demask themselves in some way, I, again, make sure that you're aware of that. But again, that is your choice. I sort of give you, give you the freedom to do that. Um, we do not have triple blind reviews. So the editors and the associate editors do see the authors of the manuscript and the reviewers of the manuscript. Um, it could be an interesting idea to look into for the future, but that's not how we do things now at the journal. How it works now at the journal is um, the manuscripts get submitted. Ocean Vartanian and I have a sort of weekly email exchange back and forth where we list off everything that was submitted in the last week and make decisions about whether it is going to be assigned to one of us as handling editor or whether it's going to be assigned to one of our associate editors as handling editors. And that's all about where your expertise is and, and who has um, various abilities and various uh, topics. And then from there, it is either desk rejected. So our associate editors do have the power to desk reject um, or it's sent to you. Uh, so yeah, open science practices, welcome. Um, we have the badges that all the APA journals have for the open science practices. We do have a method to uh, do pre-registration peer review. So if you would like that, please get in contact with me first before you submit your pre-registration, just so I know it's coming in because it has to be handled slightly differently than a full manuscript that already has results and findings. Um, but that's just back-end editorial stuff. Uh, and then... Uh, and then uh, just make sure all your links work and your data are what you say they are when you put them in because uh, it, it's a problem that we've
several times. It's pretty much the same as Thalia. Uh, we're double blind, um, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I would like to see a request for pre-registration. Please don't just send that through the general submission site. Email me first, that would be helpful. Where we do differ uh, with CRJ is we want uh, certainly in, by the time the review process is up and running, we want the data available. So we have reviewers and editors who will reanalyze the data to make sure the same conclusions come out. Um, so make sure the data set is publicly available. I know some of you are probably bothered by that statement, but if you've ever bothered to read a copyright form, um, the copyright forms all say, upon publication of this manuscript, the data will be public access. And we, we are at the point where um, in the United States and in the EU, if public funds are being used for the collection of the data, um, public access to the data is required in many cases. So as our, as our final question, this is, I don't know if this is ending on a bright note or on a down note, but it's a very interesting question. Um, so the so final question is, alas, not all manuscripts get accepted and a couple of asked. So what, what advice would you offer to people who submit work to your journal and it is rejected? So not revise and resubmit sort of reject, it's just, it's rejected. What kind of advice would you give to people, particularly relatively early career people or students whose work gets the letter they weren't hoping to get. I mean, uh, uh, I have any thoughts about this. So first of all, remember that rejection is part of the process, um, that it's just the more you submit, the more you reject. My lab has a rejection collection where everything we submit that does not get accepted, every rejection we get um, goes into the rejection collection. When we hit 100, we eat cake. It's really, it's, it's good because at least you get closer to cake when you get all of those grant and publication and fellowship rejections. Um, at PACA, uh, even with desk rejects, we try very hard to provide feedback take that feedback to heart, right? I mean, I, you know, I, we always take the time to read your manuscript and we always take the time to think about whether this is being, whether this is applicable to the journal, whether it is likely to make it through peer review based on the methods and the findings, whether it's well connected to the research literature and says something new that goes beyond what's already been published. So do, you know, take a minute, print it out and run it over with your car, whatever you need to do to sort of um, get through that like emotional shock of rejection, but then take a sort of clear eyed look at the paper and say to yourself, okay, why did this rejected? Are these fundamental flaws to what I did that can't be corrected in my current paper? And therefore, either I need to frame it as more exploratory, I need to add another study. Um, maybe this is a valuable lesson that I can put in my pocket and learn something for the next time I set up a study in this area. Um, and try to pull for yourself what the lesson is. Um, I will say that over time, the immediate reaction to being rejected may not get any lesser, but as you become more established in the field, each individual paper holds less weight. And so you can sort of take it, take a look at it and move on, take it, take a look at it and then move on. Um, keep submitting the paper to another journal but make sure that you make changes in between because while there's lots of research and lots of publications here, um, if, for example, your paper is about children and role play and imagination, I'm going to review it and I'm going to review it whether it comes to PACA or CRJ or developmental psychology or somewhere else, right? And so if the reviewer has given you comments or the editor has given you comments, take them to part about them, integrate 
what you think is full before you send it to another journal. There's nothing worse than four days after you rejected a manuscript, getting it from another journal. And it's obvious nobody has thought about this paper, edited this paper in any way, spent any time on this paper since that rejection. Um, for the most part, our reviewers and editors are good, smart people trying to do their best work to make the field a better, more scientific, more reflective of the truth of the world kind of place. So use that as sort of the fuel to learn something and move and, and move that forward. If you think like, yeah, this study is, is not salvageable. There's no way this is going to get published. Use that to spur your next research project. Use that to spur your next paper. Don't get so discouraged though that you take a perfectly good paper that just didn't make it across the, the borderline and put it in your pocket. Um, there is lots of evidence out there that women do this more than men uh, and that that's why men publish at a higher rate than women in many subdisciplines because women take a rejection and go, oh, I'm not gonna review this article anymore. I don't wanna deal with it. And men take it and go eh, on to the next journal. So try to take in the take in the criticism, see if what you can pull from it and, and get it out the door again with some changes and edits. Um, and know that I've had more papers rejected than accepted. Everyone on this call that has long CVs has an even longer CV of rejections. It, it's just part of the, it's part of the business of academia. It's part of, it's part of the day-to-day -day life of academia is rejection. I have a rather similar take and a different take. I you know, your career is, your development and learning is not done when you get a PhD. It's really not. And the feedback, including the rejections you get, is critical to your development. It really is. And I think often people don't read the rejection letters. They just look at the rejection decision and say, I don't want to think about this anymore. And I think that's a huge mistake. I really do. Use the rejection letters to help you develop. Sometimes what's needed is another study. Sometimes what's needed is additional measures. Sometimes you gotta go collect more data. At other times, really the area is not viable. And that happens. Um, and I'll use Paul as an example. Um, after Paul's sequence of studies on scoring divergent thinking measures, it, it's a little difficult for me to see how you would get another alternative study on scoring divergent thinking measures. I just see it as difficult to do. And you're probably gonna get a desk reject, but that tells you go to a different area. Don't lock yourself in too tightly to too narrow a thing. Be flexible when you get that feedback. Take it seriously, use it to develop yourself and use it to think about your research in depth and what is contributing to the field. Great, well with that, I would like to thank our panelists, Tali and Mike for uh, coming today and giving us some good advice and I, I will say because maybe they wouldn't want to say if there's one way we could we could pay repay the favor is perhaps by agreeing to serve as peer reviewers if we're asked to review <laughs> the world is full of authors submitting manuscripts but somewhat fewer reviewers reviewing them and I think this is a way we all can sort of uh, contribute to the culture of journals is to is to not just write, but to also review as well. But thank you both for doing it. And um, I hope everyone found some, some useful nuggets of wisdom here to help guide them in the writing this summer. So hey, thanks, thanks again, you. everyone. And we'll, we'll see you in the journals. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Jen. Bye, everybody. Good to see you. Thank you.